So today I'm going to talk to you about some new results we got on the final stages of continental breakup of the eastern North American margin, and in particular, part of the margin that is off of North Carolina. But before I move forward, I would like to thank all my collaborators, Bill Davis and Jeff Gibson at Lamont, and Brandon uh, Schuck and Harm Vendong from UTIG. And all the results I'm going to show you are from the data collected during the ENAM community seismic experiment. And here I show you a map um, with the active source seismic profile coll collected during this uh, community seismic experiment. And these are the black line and orange circles. And the green lines here are previous key seismic profile from the 70s, 80s, and early 90s that have really shaped our understanding of the, of the formation of this margin. But because the ENAM profile extended farther seaward than previous seismic survey, it actually allows us to propose a new model for the formation of this margin and in which the complete uh, continental breakup was delayed by at least 15 million years, even though there was uh, some magmatism during the late stages of rifting. And um, the complete continental breakup didn't occur um, at the East Coast Magnetic Anomaly, which is this um, positive wide high amplitude anomaly that runs parallel to the margin, as it was like previously thought, but um, it occurred at this very weak and narrow magnetic anomaly that is the Black Spur Magnetic Anomaly that is located 200 kilometers farther seaward than the ECMA. So the Eastern North American margin uh, formed by the rifting of the Pangaea supercontinent and the opening of the, the Central Atlantic during the late Triassic and early Jurassic. And uh, the rifting of the supercontinent Pangaea started around 230 million years with the, forma with the, the formation of a series of onshore rift basins that are highlighted in red here. And there was not any significant uh, magmatic activity during these early stages of rifting. And here is a figure showing you the different onshore reef basing along the eastern US from south to north and their tectonic activity uh, through time. And near the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, there were huge amount of lava lavas that were erupted across North and South America, Africa, and Europe. And this is known as the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. And this is one of the world's largest igneous province. And the duration of, uh, of camp igneous activity was very short, less than uh, 1 million years. And the origin of um, this uh, magmatism uh, is still debated. And also, there are more and more studies that uh, will rather suggest a shallow asthenospheric upwelling for uh, the source of camp. And in particular, there are studies that are based on the olivine composition of the camp lavas that indicate that the, pot the mental potential temperature for the camp source ranged between 14, uh, 1430, 1480. And the purple line here refers to uh, camp and you can see that the extension in the southern offshore uh, rift basin uh, had already stopped prior to CAM. So shortly after CAM, the rifting uh, successfully proceeded along this zone uh, offshore, but the timing and the duration of the transition from continental breakup to seafloor spreading is not very well uh, constrained, and this is mostly because this transi transition occurred during the Jurassic magnetic quiet zone with the oceanic crust here that is producing very um, weak and broad magnetic lineation and for which we cannot assign any edge number or crown number. So the, the spreading rate for the oceanic crust after a breakup is not very well constrained, but it's, it is generally assumed that the seafloor spreading uh, began at the ECMA and the most recent edge for the IGMA range between 190 and 195 million years. So previous seismic data uh, from the, the 80s and the early 90s show that the final stages of continental breakup were accompanied by significant magmatism. And actually the deep structure of the ENAM has the, all the characteristics uh, of a magma rich uh, rifted margin. And here I'm showing you the edge pro seismic profile that is located 
in the Baltimore Canyon trough up here. And the multi-channel seismic reflection data have imaged a wedge here of seaward dipping reflector along the edge of the continental margin and that are interpreted to be a sub erupted basal flow that were in place during the late stages of rifting. And these are the, the, the wedges, wedges of SDR along the margin that are thought to give rise to the ECMA. And the P-wave velocity model from uh, the refraction um, show that uh, there is a zone of very high velocity in the lower crust and uh, just beneath the SDR and that they are interpreted as a sand rift uh, igneous intrusion within the lower crust or, or mafic underplated at the base of the crust. So from previous seismic survey, we have a evidence of very uh, offshore sand rift magmatism. Uh, but as I mentioned to you earlier, most of the previous survey focused on the ECMA, but little was known about the, what was going on onshore and farther seaward of the ECMA, so it might not be that simple. So in 2014, 2015, a large community seismic experiment took place uh, off, offshore North Carolina, and the INAM uh, study area encompasses uh, the entire rifting margin from an extending continental lithosphere onshore to mature continental lithosphere offshore. And during this community experiment, we acquired 3,700 kilometers of multi-channel seismic data, while with reflection refraction data along those main uh, regional lines. And um, the OBS are shown here by yellow triangles. And uh, we had also a network of proband OBS for a year for deep imaging. And two refraction profiles were acquired onshore. And this is shown by the the um, orange triangle. And today in this talk, I'm uh, only going to focus on the offshore active source data from this experiment. And in particular, uh, these two uh, regional lines that are perpendicular to the margin and uh, that are coincident with refraction data. So what are the major and new observations that can be, that can be made uh, from this data. And here I'm showing you the northern profile, the line one, and the southern profile, line two, across the Carolina trough. And uh, I'm going to start uh, by the main characteristic of the crust at the ECMA, at the East Coast Magnetic Anomaly. And both profile at the ECMA, the crust thin from uh, 16 kilometer here to 10 kilometer here, and from 28 kilometer here, uh, to about eight kilometers here. And the main necking zone on this line is about uh, 88 kilometers wide. And I highlighted um, by a thick black line here, the 7.2 kilometer per se second velocity contour, because this contour is often taken as the contour that delineates the magmatic uh, intrusion. And you can see that there are several patches of high velocity uh, in the lower crust that are four kilometer thick. And if we compare this new result to the results from the edge profile that I showed you earlier, you can see that the overall thickness of the high velocity material uh, that we image from the refraction new, from the refraction modeling is much less than what was modeled for the edge profile further to the north. Here we have several package of um, several patches of um, high velocity. And here there is a continuous 10 to 15 kilometer thick layer of high velocity. So there might be less thin rift magmatism that was uh, previously thought. And another important observation is that the width of the necking zone at, the, at this margin is a, little, is a little wider than the margin where we have uh, localized a very large amount of thin rift magmatism. <clears throat> this is the, the case of the Pelotas Basin of, of uh, Brazil or offshore southeast Green, Greenland. On the coincident multi channel seismic data, we image seaward dipping reflector near the base of uh, the acoustic basement, near the, the acoustic basement. And on line one, we only image a few, deep and be, a few <clears throat> dipping reflector that could be part of a SDR 
package and more convincingly on the southern profile, just seaward of the inch zone, we image more seaward dipping reflector. And you can see that the inner wedge of SDR is 25 kilometer wide and five kilometer thick. And further seaward, the imaging of the seaward dipping reflection become more difficult because the, the thickness of the sediment increase and it include a, a layer of salt, salt diapirism, and some high velocity carbonate. And because the SDR are difficult to image at this margin, we undertook a very simple forward modeling of the magnetic data. And these provide us a very, very, very rough estimates of the spatial S extent and the thickness of the SDR package along both profile. And the forward modeling indicates that the shape and the amplitude of the East Coast magnetic anomaly can be explained by a 25 kilometer wide and six kilometer thick uh, body with high susceptibility along this profile and uh, 180 and six kilometer thick uh, body on the southern profile. And this smaller width on uh, along line one would be in agreement with the ECMA being narrower in this region. See one of the ICMA, we image major change, changes in the seismic structure of the crust, and this change uh, appears to be to occur around the BSMA. So between the ECMA and the BSMA, the crust is thin. We have a mean crustal thic thickness of 6.3 kilometer here, uh, eight uh, here, and with very high velocity in the lower crust, up to 7.5 kilometer per second here, with a rough uh, basement and uh, the P wave velocity here uh, from uh, refraction suggests that actually the crust is igneous with high velocity in the lower crust. And seaward of the BSMA, the crust is thicker and the basement is very smooth and the lower crust uh, display only moderately high seismic velocity. And actually, the crust appears to uh, taper off in, in thickness uh, to eight kilometer. And this is actually normal crustal thickness for oceanic crust of Jurassic age. This is based on previous study that consider that the mantle was a little warmer due to the effect of the thermal insulation of the mantle beneath the supercontinent Pangaea. And across the BSMA, we image a step up here in the basement and we have a very large and sudden increase um, in the crustal thickness that include a crystal wood here. So the refraction data give us some new constraint on the mental potential temperature and Brendan, Brendan and Harm at UTIG perform a range of mental melting and crystallization calculation and uh, in which they tested different mental composition, activity and temperature. And then they compare the predicted P wave velocity in the lower crust and crustal thickness from this model to the P wave uh, velocity in the lower crust and the crustal thickness from the tomographic inversion uh, of the refraction data. And they first did that, they first did that for uh, the refraction profile along the black spur magnetic anomaly. And they find that our observation along the BSMA are best explained by a primitive mental composition, little active uh, equaling, and a mental potential temperature, temperature that range between uh, 1395 and uh, 1420 in the north. Um, so this is slightly higher than the 1355 degree that is required to produce normal normal oceanic crust. And uh, similarly, they found slightly higher mental potential temperature between the ECMA and the BSMA. And as I mentioned to you earlier, um, the most recent estimate of the mental potential temperature for CAM source uh, ranged between 1430 and, uh, and 1480s. And from all these mantle temperature estimate, it seemed that the upper mantle was slightly, was slightly uh, cooling with time. And if the complete uh, lithospheric breakup was achieved uh, at the ECMA uh, with this slow decrease of potential mantle temperature, we would expect that the ocean crust 
immediately see one of the ECMA to uh, progressive to be thick and to progressively decrease in thickness. And we would also expect the top basement to be as smooth as it is here because uh, with higher than normal uh, mental potential temperature, uh, you reduce the brittle fracturing and you will you allow um, and this allows for long shielded lava flows to be in place and both will tend to smooth the basement. So this would be similar to what I've been observed off of Greenland, but it, this is not what we observe here. So how can we explain uh, the, that we have this uh, very thin crust with very rough basement between the ECMA and the BSMA? And here I'm, sh I'm showing you a zoom into the basement seaward of the uh, ECMA for four, four profile along the margin. And you can see here that for all the profile, the top basement between the ECMA and the BSMA uh, is very rough. And uh, in some area faulted with faults uh, that are imaged at least down to three kilometers within the crust. Further seaward, the basement roughness here uh, slightly decreased. And the topography is similar to oceanic crust accredited at slow spreading range. And just landward of uh, BSMA, we image a basement, very clearly a basement step up on all the profile and further seaward, the basement is very smooth and very reflective. So what I need next is was to divide the top basement into three parts of equal lengths. And here I'm showing you an example for the southern profile. So two uh, boxes that are between the ECMA and the BSMA, BSMA and what one box that, uh, that is at or seaward of BSMA. And then I computed, I computed the residual basement height in purple here, and I extracted the mean uh, lower crustal velocity in orange and the crustal uh, thickness. And you can see here that the basement is the roughest just seaward of the ECMA, and this is also where the velocity the crustal velocity from the refraction are the highest. And you can also see a slight decrease of the basement roughness this time in the seaward direction between the ECMA and the BSMA. And for each box, we then estimated the roughness as the root mean square deviation of the top basement. And here is the figure showing you uh, the basement roughness as a function of the spreading rate. And the red curve here is uh, from the best fitting, the best fitting curve from a um, uh, compilation from Marlon Verno in 1991. And the gray sim symbol here are from a more recent compilation from Soder and Tal in 2018 that focused on uh, ultra slow to, to slow modern ridge axis and flanks. And here I uh, reported the um, RMS roughness that we calculated for the, the thin crust uh, between the ECMA and the BSMA on two Malin's Vernos curve. And this figure is actually showing you that the crust immediate, immediately seaward of the ECMA has a roughness that is similar to modern day oceanic crusts that are accreted at a trustful spring, uh, spring rate. And this is actually a very interesting observation. So, because if we looked at the um, macro seismic activity along the, the ocean, uh, mid-ocean ridge axis, uh, you can see that for ultra slow spreading crust, the depths of the, the, the earthquake can be quite deep. And this shows you that at ultra slow spreading ridge, we have a thick, we have a thick axial lithosphere or a thick thermal boundary layer. So for the inner margin, the roughness of this oceanic crust just seaward of the ECMA have been similar to uh, being similar to modern ultra slow spreading environment could uh, indicate us the, the, the presence of a lithosphere thermal lead when this crust uh, was uh, accreted. What would be the effect of this lithospheric lead? And this, uh, so this lead would truncate the shadow region of mental upwelling. This would also tend to defocus melt, melt extraction and uh, the very slow spreading rate will um, allow for the upwelling mental to lose heat by conduction. By conduction. And so all of this would uh, reduce the total 
volume of melt that, that, are, that is generated by the compression melting and would lead to a thinner igneous, igneous crust. And independently, Brandon and Hahn tested a petrological model in which they also truncated the shallow part of the melting zone. And this provides more quantitative estimate. And they find here the presence of a 20 kilometer thick uh, lithospheric lead for the southern profile, line two, and a 15 kilometer thick lithospheric lead for uh, the northern profile. And this is required to explain the thickness of the crust and the high velocity in the lower crust that are observed between the ECMA and the BSMA. So the mental lithospheric lead could either be oceanic or continental, but given the relatively hot uh, condition here, it's, we think that it's very unlikely that an oceanic lithosphere could be preserved. So the best candidate would be uh, the continental mantle lithosphere. So we call this domain between ECMA and BSMA the proto-oceanic proto domain. And this model will also imply that the breakup of the crust occur before the complete rupture of the continental mantle lithosphere. And actually what's also interesting is that we observe an increase in the spreading rate within this proto-oceanic proto domain from ultra slow to uh, slow spreading, to slow spreading, and this could be taken as an indication of the the thermal or chemical erosion, and with this uh, thermal weakening, this would uh, progressively remove the pre-existing pre-existing lithospheric lead and eventually induce the complete continental breakup at the BSMA. So in this model the BSMA will represent the onset of focused steady state normal seafloor spreading and the sharp step up uh, that, uh, and the lower crystal wood here that, uh, that is imaged at the BSMA could be, could be explained by a magmatic pulse when we had a complete failure, failure of the lithosphere. So uh, the, the structure of the BSMA is consistent with strain localization with, uh, and the transition to normal seafloor spreading and with mantle flow at the base of the press. So to conclude, what I've tried to show you is that we had thin rift melt in the continental lithosphere that was extending at very slow rates. And also, also, uh, this, also this melt thermally weakened the lithosphere the magmatism did not actually lead to a rapid strain localization and complete rupture at the EGMA, as it's, it was previously thought. Instead, we have uh, this uh, proto-oceanic domain in, in which the new igneous crust form above a thick thermal continental mantle lead. And in this proto-oceanic proto domain, we had some evidence that the pre-existing continental mantle was gradually gradually thinning. So the complete rupture was achieved at the BSMA and uh, was associated with a magmatic pulse, with a BSMA uh, that represents the onset of localized and normal seafloor spreading. And actually we thought that this, the, these are the lower, the low extension rate in the final stage of rifting that may have influenced the thermal structure of the lithosphere and that, that, could be, that could explain the delay for continental breakup. So the, the, the take home message here will be that although continental rifting is assisting, assisted by magmatic activity, it does not always lead to rapid localization of extensional strain and complete rupture of the continental lithosphere. Thank you.